How did the Americas become populated? It's a complicated question with a number of potential answers. What we do know is that the land mass was populated in the so-called Age of Discovery that began with Columbus's voyage in 1492. But what came before? The US National Park Service recently published a fascinating article on the history of the theory that the population of the Americas began via a land bridge that is now submerged by the Bering Strait. Obviously this is a theory, albeit a very well-founded one, but there are competing hypotheses, some with more credible foundations than others. Some of these are addressed in the article, and I will expand on alternative theories towards the end of this video. So, what did the article say? Well, the piece begins by saying that the continent of North America has been inhabited by humans for at least 16,500 years. It then alludes to some of those other theories I mentioned. The piece read, As early as the 1500s, early settlers and European thinkers were interested in discovering how humans had come to populate North and South America. One theory suggests the migration of Norsemen across Greenland into North America. Another theory proposed the island of Atlantis as the origins of human life in the New World. Yet another idea proposed that the inhabitants had generated out of mud. However, by the early 1800s, scientists and theorists began discussing the possibility of a land bridge that had spanned between Asia and North America thousands of years ago. The theory of a land bridge has fueled the imagination of explorers and scientists for centuries. The first suggestion of a land bridge was made by José de Acosta. In 1590, the Spanish missionary José de Acosta, who closely studied the Mexica or Aztec civilization and wrote about them, as well as the Incas in his 1590 work Historia Natural y Moral de las Indias, Natural and Moral History of the Indies. The work was also the first written record to suggest a land bridge connecting Asia to North America. The expansive manuscript also observed, in detail, the winds, tides, lakes, rivers, plants, animals and mineral resources of the New World. The question of how people migrated to the New World was a topic widely debated among the thinkers and theorists of his time. Acosta rejected many of the theories proposed by his contemporaries. Instead, he believed that hunters from Asia had crossed into North America via a land bridge or narrow strait located far to the north. He thought the land bridge was still in existence during his lifetime. During the 18th century, Peter the Great, the Russian Tsar from 1682 to 1725, chartered an exploration of the eastern borders of the Russian Empire. He recruited the Danish explorer Vitus Bering to lead an expedition in the then unnamed Bering Strait region. Before the expedition, maps of Siberia sometimes contained a large landmass across the water from the Chukchi Peninsula, however no definite account of travel through the strait had been recorded by the early 1700s. The two voyages of Bering, the first in 1724 and the second in 1741, confirmed what many people on the Chukchi Peninsula already knew that there was land and even people across the water, people who had been trading and travelling across the Bering Strait for thousands of years. The second explorer to confirm the existence of present-day Alaska was the Englishman, Captain James Cook. On his 1778 expedition, he produced detailed maps of the Alaskan coast. The results of this exploration helped enlighten the outside world about the Bering Strait region. As news about Bering and Cook's travels reach Russia, Europe and other parts of the world, theories of human migration between Asia and North America gained strength. The confirmation of a strait between Asia and North America fueled an interest in the possibility of a wide plain that might have connected the two continents. Beginning in the early 1800s, American scientists and naturalists started investigating archaeological sites on the east coast of the United States, slowly working their way towards the west coast. The findings of these forebears to modern archaeology suggested that people hadn't originated in North America, but had populated to the continent from another place. However, from where and how had yet to be discovered. From about 1890 to 1925, research, discussion and inquiry about the peopling of North America stalled because of inconclusive data. It wasn't until the mid-1920s that scientists would finally restart the search for evidence of how people came to North America. This brings us to David M. Hopkins. Hopkins studied geology at the University of New Hampshire before accepting a position with the U.S. Geological Survey in 1942. 
His first trip to Alaska planted a seed of fascination for the wild and beautiful landscape of the area. During his lifetime, Hopkins spent many of his summers on the Seward Peninsula, often researching geology in the area that later became the preserve. He made several key contributions to the study of the region dubbed Beringia. He helped publish two books that contained papers written by researchers from a wide range of backgrounds and collaborated with many scientists and researchers to make groundbreaking discoveries about the Bering Land Bridge. For years, scientists speculated about the different types of vegetation that might have been found on the land bridge. Some scientists believe the land bridge contained uniformed vegetation similar to the current Arctic plain vegetation. Hopkins and several other scientists, however, were convinced that the land bridge had supported more diverse vegetation, with plants growing in response to elevation variations and the amount of surface water. Hopkins worked with Mary Edwards, Claudia Hoffel and Victoria Gertrude Wolfe to confirm the age of plants frozen in a layer of ash from the eruption at Devil Mountain 18,000 years ago. The findings from their collaboration helped to confirm that the type of vegetation on the land bridge had been more diverse than originally thought. Hopkins had a special ability to forge connections between scientists and researchers from many backgrounds. He linked research conducted by people across many different disciplines to strengthen the concept of the Bering Land Bridge theory. He reached out to scientists and researchers studying the Chukotka Peninsula and brought their work to the attention of researchers and scientists studying the Seward Peninsula. He recognised the need for interdisciplinary study to understand the whole picture of Beringia. His passion for the Bering Land Bridge was instrumental in not only creating the Bering Land Bridge National Preserve, but also in building interest for the Bering Land Bridge theory. Another somewhat unlikely theory, however, is the so-called Solutrean Hypothesis. This theory suggests that the earliest settlers of North America may have come from Europe by crossing the Atlantic Ocean during the Upper Paleolithic period. It is based on the similarity between certain artefacts, specifically spearheads found in Solutrean archaeological sites in France and those found in North America among the Clovis culture, specifically in the eastern part of the continent. The Solutrean hypothesis was first introduced by American archaeologists Dennis Stanford and Bruce Bradley in the early 2000s. They argued that the so-called Solutrean points, a distinctive type of stone tool associated with the Solutrean culture of France and Spain, bore a resemblance to the Clovis points in North America. Clovis points are spearheads that are a defining characteristic of the Clovis culture, which is generally considered to be one of the earliest cultures in the Americas. This visual similarity led Stanford and Bradley to suggest that Solutrean populations may have migrated to North America. However, this theory lacks strong supporting evidence and is met with scepticism within the scientific community and remains controversial. While the visual similarity between the stone tools is intriguing, it doesn't necessarily indicate a direct cultural connection. Similarities in stone tool technology can arise independently due to convergent evolution or functional requirements. A significant obstacle to the theory's basis, in fact, is the absence of physical evidence linking the two continents during the proposed time period. The last glacial maximum, which occurred around 26,000 to 19,000 years ago, resulted in extensive ice coverage over North America and Europe. This can be seen in the vast swathes of white on the map. The distance between the two continents at that time would also have been vast, and the ice sheets would have made any sea voyages extremely treacherous. Critics argue that the Solutrean populations would have needed advanced maritime technology to successfully navigate such conditions, which is not supported by current archaeological evidence. Additionally, genetic studies of ancient and modern populations provide insights into the peopling of the Americas. Genetic evidence indicates that the ancestors of Native Americans likely arrived in the Americas via the theorized Beringia land bridge between 15,000 to 20,000 years ago. This timeline contradicts the Solutrean hypothesis, which proposes an earlier arrival from Europe. In recent years, advancements in genetic research and technology have further undermined the Solutrean hypothesis. DNA studies of ancient human remains have revealed a clear link between the indigenous peoples of the Americas and Asian populations, supporting the Beringian migration theory. There is therefore no substantial genetic evidence linking Native American populations to European populations of the Upper Paleolithic. There is potentially some DNA trace of another group present in the Americas prior to the Columbian period, however. There is some evidence suggesting that there may have been limited contact between Polynesian populations and indigenous South Americans in pre-Columbian times. 
The most well-known example of this is the theory of the sweet potato hypothesis, which suggests that the sweet potato, a crop native to South America, was somehow transported to Polynesia before the arrival of Europeans. However, the extent and nature of this contact is still debated among researchers, and the genetic evidence is not yet fully conclusive. So Clovis first is viewed as the accepted archaeological theory of the peopling of the Americas. It is widely believed that the ancestors of the Clovis culture crossed the Bering Land Bridge during the last Ice Age. This land bridge emerged due to lower sea levels caused by the accumulation of ice in northern parts of the planet. The crossing is thought to have occurred around 13,000 to 12,000 years ago as people migrated from Siberia into North America. The Clovis culture is often associated with some of the earliest archaeological evidence of human presence in the Americas, and it's believed to have originated from these migrations across Beringia. However, evidence is limited to just one instance of skeletal remains to support the theory. These remains are those found at the site called Anzic 1 in Montana. The Anzic 1 remains were discovered alongside Clovis artefacts, including Clovis-style stone tools and projectile points. The Anzic One individual, however, was not a warrior or hunter, but a young child. The site has been dated to approximately 12,800 years old. Genetic analysis of the remains revealed that the individual is closely related to modern Native American populations. This finding strongly supports the idea that the Clovis culture is ancestrally linked to the indigenous peoples of the Americas. Norse exploration and settlement of North America is a fascinating topic that featured in historic stories for centuries, but has gained intellectual credence since the 1960s. The Norse, and most notably Leif Eriksson, are believed to have established a settlement in North America around the 10th century, in an area now known as Lonson Meadow, in modern-day Newfoundland, Canada. This site provides evidence of their presence, but the settlements were thought to have been short-lived and did not have a lasting impact on the region's history. There are accounts of meetings and violent clashes between the Norse and the natives, who the Norse refer to as Skreling. There is no strong evidence to suggest that the Norse presence persisted in North America beyond a few years, and it's unclear whether any significant number of Norse remained in the region over the long term. Their settlements, or at least the areas they explored, are thought to have been further south than the Lonso Mido site, however. One particular location they referred to was Vinland, a place where grapes are thought to have grown among lush vegetation. While there are no specific Norse legends associated with North America, the Norse sagas and historical records do mention Vinland, the area believed to be part of present-day Canada, although some suggest it was as far south as the present-day United States. The sagas, like the Vinland sagas, recount the voyages of Norse explorers to this region, but they do not go into the realm of myth or legendary storytelling in the same way as other Norse sagas do for places like Scandinavia. The stories about Vinland are more grounded in historical accounts and exploration rather than legendary or mythical elements. Alleged Norse artefacts such as runestones have been found in various places in North America, providing potential evidence of their presence. The most famous of these is the Kensington runestone, discovered in Minnesota in 1898, with the legend potentially giving rise to the name of the Minnesota Vikings American football team. The inscription on the stone suggests that Scandinavian explorers may have reached the area in the 14th century. However, the authenticity and interpretation of the stone has not been verified. And now we move into legend rather than serious academic thinking. One such example is the so-called Moon-Eyed People, and a connection to an alleged ancient Welsh prince. The legend of the Moon-Eyed People is part of Appalachian folklore. This myth recounts the mysterious tale of a group of bearded individuals with fair skin, rumoured to be the descendants of Prince Madoc. These strange entities are said to have inhabited the region before the Cherokee people, Passed down through generations, particularly in the southeastern United States, the origins of the tale are a blend of historical whispers and imaginative storytelling with no actual evidence. The Moon-Eyed People legend is varied depending on who is telling it. Common versions describe these individuals as having the aforementioned fair skin and beards, as well as distinctive moon-like eyes sensitive to sunlight. The mysterious beings are often depicted as peaceful, introverted figures with a predilection for the cover of night. One fascinating twist within the legend is the alleged connection to Prince Madoc, who, according to folklore, sailed to North America in the 12th century. Some variations of the story propose that the Moon-Eyed people were descendants of Madoc's expedition. 
the Madoc connection brings an intriguing perspective to the Moon-Eyed People legend. Prince Madoc is said to have embarked on a transatlantic journey with his retinue and sailed to America long before Columbus. The legend suggests that these early Welsh explorers intermingled with the indigenous population, resulting in the Moon-Eyed People. The theory gained traction during the 19th century, driven by the allure of pre-Columbian exploration and ancestral connections. While the historical veracity of the legend remains unproven, its enduring presence in the cultural narrative highlights the role of folklore in shaping regional character. Proponents of the myth point to the alleged evidence of Fort Mountain State Park in Georgia. The park is home to a mysterious stone wall, believed to have been built by Native Americans for defensive or ritual purposes, but its exact origin and purpose remain a subject of debate and legend. Some tales suggest it was built by Madoc and his followers and is the ruins of fortifications. Other tall tales bizarrely claim it is the work of extraterrestrials. Quite why they'd build a wall is beyond me, but the true purpose of it is still definitively not known. Another very much out there story tells of a tribe of red-headed giants centred around a cave in what is now Nevada. The legend of Lovelock Cave is a fascinating story which has yielded valuable insights into the ancient indigenous people who inhabited the area and has been the subject of speculation regarding alleged giant beings. The dry conditions within the cave preserved an array of artefacts, tools and even perishable materials that would otherwise have deteriorated over time. The legend of the Lovelock Cave Giants derives from reports of unusually large skeletal remains found within. According to Peyute oral history, the Siti Ka, or red-haired giants, were believed to be a tribe of cannibalistic giants that lived in the area. The legend describes them as being much larger and taller than the Peyute people. These giants were said to have clashed with the Peyute tribe in ancient times, leading to conflicts and battles. The discovery of the mummified remains of a man who was 6 foot 6 inches tall with reddish hair in Lovelock Cave by guano miners in 1911 added to the intrigue. Some have speculated that these remains might be related to the red-haired giants, while others argue that the mummies might belong to a different group of people altogether. There are also possible explanations that could debunk some of the claims. About a hundred miles north of the cave, fossils of mammoths and cave bears have been discovered that experts say could have been mistaken for giant human bones. It has also been suggested that hair coloration could change after death, with environmental factors like temperature and soil able to transform darker hair to a rusty reddish colour. The Atlantis legend originates from the ancient Greek philosopher Plato's dialogues Timaeus and Critias. In these writings, Plato describes Atlantis as a powerful and advanced civilization that existed around 9,000 years before his time. He portrays Atlantis as a technologically advanced island nation located beyond the Pillars of Hercules, often identified as the Strait of Gibraltar. According to the legend, Atlantis was an ideal society with a prosperous economy and powerful military. However, its people became corrupt and morally degraded, leading to their downfall. Atlantis supposedly attempted to conquer Athens, but their aggression was repelled by the Athenians and the gods, resulting in a catastrophic event that caused Atlantis to sink into the sea, disappearing forever. The story of Atlantis has captured the imagination of people for centuries, inspiring various theories and interpretations about its potential location, existence and significance. Some have suggested that Atlantis could have been a real ancient civilization, while others view it as a myth or allegory. Despite extensive speculation, there is no conclusive evidence to support the existence of Atlantis as described by Plato. Despite this, however, some have theorised that refugees from the destroyed empire made it to the Americas, where they alluded to their former civilization in various expressions of monumental art, architecture and mythology. There have also been some rather fanciful theories of exploration, settlement and resource harvesting during the classical Greek period, but, again, evidence is scant. Mormon beliefs include the idea that some indigenous peoples of North and South America are descendants of ancient Israelites who migrated to the Americas. This belief is based on the Book of Mormon, a religious text considered sacred by members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The Book of Mormon narrates the story of these migrations and their interactions with God. Legends surrounding the Knights Templar in America are part of various conspiracy theories and speculative narratives. One of the most well-known legends involves the idea that the Templars, after their dissolution in the early 14th century, fled to North America to hide their treasures and establish a secret society. 
These tales often tie in with the idea of Templar involvement in Freemasonry and the development of a secret society that played a role in shaping American history for centuries. Another popular legend suggests that the Templars visited North America before Columbus, claiming that they had advanced knowledge of navigation and maps that allowed them to reach the continent. This narrative often intertwines with theories about the origins of the Kensington runestone, suggesting a connection between Templars and early Scandinavian explorers. It's important to note that these legends are largely unsupported by historical evidence and are considered speculative at best. The Templar myths in America are often more a product of imaginative storytelling and conspiracy theories than verified historical accounts. And so it seems we're left with the Beringian land bridge hypothesis as the most likely way by which North and South America were populated. But, just maybe, some of the legends have a grain of truth. However, even if they don't, the story of the Siberian people's migration in the distant past, dodging short-faced bears and other terrors, and navigating treacherous conditions, is an epic story all by itself. That's it for this video. Don't forget to like, share and most importantly subscribe. And you can also support the channel on Subscribestar via the link in the description and by YouTube Super Thanks. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.